Thank you, praise team. We have a handout we're going to give out at this time, if the ushers would help out with that here in a moment. And uh, it coincides with our special guest this morning. Many of you know him. Many of you have met him. Uh, He has been a friend of mine for quite a while now. Ever since I came to Cornerstone, he befriended me. And um, uh, just a good man, a, a, a man who loves the Lord, is willing to work for the Lord, to serve the Lord. And we appreciate him. He's always an encouragement. I really appreciate, Carrie, when you sing. Uh, Carrie sings to the Lord, and uh, it's a blessing to me. I wish every person in here would sing like you sing, and I don't mean that as a joke. I mean that honestly and sincerely. Uh, He truly worships the Lord, and uh, we can learn that from him, if nothing else. But um, Carrie is is with Paraclete Missions Group, and uh, Paraclete means to come alongside, and he helps uh, mainly Joy and Leland Cuddy uh, in India. He helps uh, with a school there. He does many travels over there. He does a great job with the ministry of helping support uh, certain people who are trying to bring the gospel to a group of people who have not really heard the gospel. And so he is doing the Lord's work uh, here at, in the home states and also in India, and he has many connections with many people. Just, uh, just a joy to be around. He has the joy of the Lord in his heart, and uh, we're excited for him to come this morning and bring the gospel message to us. Would you guys help me welcome Carrie Childry? evaluation is true rather than another evaluation I received when I was studying for the ministry and I was sitting next to an austere classmate of mine named Tony. Uh, His last name started with C, my last name started with C and I was singing out in chapel and he punched me. He said, Childry, has the Lord called you to preach? I said, yes, Tony, he has. He said, well, stick to preaching and forget the singing. So, um, One of us was off key there, and I always like to think it wasn't me, but um, Dave, I'll pay you later for that great singing endorsement, brother. Thank you for your (laughs) encouragement. It is great to be with you this morning. I want to thank uh, the ushers um, for giving out this handout on um, Jude. And without further ado, I want us just to give attention to the reading as Paul exhorted Timothy. And I want to read the book of Jude to you this morning. If you're looking for one page summary of the true gospel, it's the book of Jude. The whole gospel is in this one chapter. It's the last or next to the last book in the Bible. And uh, you can follow along in your Bibles or on the handout sheet I gave you. We'll be using that handout sheet during the message. But let us read the scripture. And you follow along silently as I read out loud, if you will, the book of Jude. Uh, the next to the last book in the New Testament. Shall we read? Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord having saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode He has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over 
to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh are set forth as an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael the archangel in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses dared not bring against him a reviling accusation but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know. And whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts in these things, they corrupt themselves. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the era of Balaam for profit, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are spots in your love feast, while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lust, and they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lust. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And on some have compassion, making a distinction. But others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Shall we pray together? Our Father and our God, how we thank you for your word. And we pray it would not return void this morning as we study it, as we read it, as we meditate upon it, and by the grace of God as we apply it. And use us in lights in this world as members of a perverse and crooked generation, as the scriptures say. Thank you that you offer salvation to all who will come, but eternal judgment to all those who refuse. In Jesus' name we ask it, amen. I want to thank Dave again for the privilege of preaching for him this July 5th, this July 4th weekend Sunday. And two special friends of mine are here this morning, Don uh, or Tom and Donna McMurray from Swanee. D Tom and Donna, would you all stand up, please? They're dear friends and prayer supporters for years, and let's give them a warm welcome uh, for visiting with us this morning. So glad to have them. Thank you, Tom and Donna. Tom is an elder in his church and a great prayer warrior and prayer leader, and Donna the same. You know, Pastor Dave has really set a 
tone of sobriety and wisdom, I think, in the last week or two especially as he's responded to how a great pall has dropped over our nation. And I was reading in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution this article called Impact on Religion and Business. And the Reverend Brian Wright of Johnson Ferry Baptist Church in East Cobb said he expected the decision of the Supreme Court that approved marriage among same-sex couples, but it still hit him hard when it happened. It's like when you feel the death of a loved one coming on you're expecting, Wright said, but when you finally get the news it's a kick in the gut, there's a sense of sadness. Wright said he can feel the largest society pulling away from his church and his teachings, and he worries about more government pressure on churches to accept ways that are contrary to God's law. But on the opposite side of that issue, a woman pastor in Decatur at a large mainline denomination said, we rejoice over equal protection under the law being extended to our LGBT parishioners. And while full exclusion has not yet been supported by our denomination as a whole, and she names the denomination, those of us who support it will continue our work until our polity reflects the wisdom of the court. Two different views among those who claim to be Christians and even servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. What's going on? The book of Jude has told us what's going on. And if you have your handouts this morning, I've given you a red, white, and blue printout of the whole book of Jude. And I said, you know, if I were trying to translate the book of Jude for the mission field and make it come alive, what are some of the ways I would try to do that? So I went through the book of Jude after Dave asked me to preach this Sunday. And so I've tried to expand on the meanings of the word that are here, and they're all synonyms for the words that Jude used to write the New Testament. Let's look at verse 1. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that have been sanctified. Who was Jude? He's very humble here. He doesn't tell us he was a brother of Jesus. And he didn't believe in Jesus along with his other brothers until Jesus was crucified, dead, buried, and risen from the dead. God raised him from the dead and ascended into heaven. And then he realized, I've been a brother to the Lord. Who better to advise us in these tremulous and terrible times than a flesh brother of our Lord Jesus Christ? Now, Jesus was the only begotten Son of God. He was born of a virgin, Mary. But after Mary had Jesus... She was no longer a virgin. She was a married woman producing brothers and sisters. And that's who Jude is. And he tells us here that those of us who have put our faith in Christ, and this is a very comforting passage here, and we'll get through as much of this as we can this morning, it says that we have been sanctified by God the Father. You know, I read a book recently. It's a very excellent book I'm, I'm working on. And uh, none of our books, none of our sermons are perfect. Only the Word of God is without error. But it said we're justified by faith and we're sanctified by the law. Nothing can be further from the truth. John Wesley loved to preach on 1 Corinthians 1, 30 and 31, where it says that Jesus Christ has become to us wisdom and righteousness and redemption and what? And sanctification. All is in Jesus and Jesus is all. When I'm in Christ, I have all those wonderful things. I'm sanctified. I'm made holy in Him. Now, my old flesh nature, and my mom and sister are here this morning so they can uh, attest to the truth of this. If I ever walk in the flesh, I'm just as sinful as anybody else. I can be as sinful as anybody else. And I have to repent to God and repent to them when I do something wrong. And so do you. You see, I'm not going to lose this old flesh nature until I die. But it's like Paul Rader, the great song leader for D.L. Moody uh, in his ministry, who succeeded um, D.L. Moody in his ministry with Tory Johnson. He was on his deathbed, and he was dying, and one of his disciples said, Oh, Paul Rader, it's so sad to see you 
withering up on this death bed and dying. He said, don't weep for me. He said, I died 37 years ago when I received Jesus Christ as my Savior. You see, this flesh nature we have is condemned, it's dying, it's never going to get any better. But the new nature we have in Christ is sanctified, it's holy, it can never sin. It can never go off the reservation, so to speak. It's always going to be doing what God pleases because it's Christ in us, the hope of glory, Colossians tells us. And not only have we been sanctified, and that's a perfect tense there for you uh, English teachers and grammarians, which means something has happened in the past with a continually wonderful impact into the future and the present, but we've been preserved in Jesus Christ. We're kept for that day of judgment. We've been born again. We've passed from death into life. And so Jude says in verse 2, May mercy be unto you and peace and love multiply. But what he says there, he so phrases that as we study the wording there, that it's a conditional tense. In other words, this is my wish for you, but it's going to be dependent upon your obedience to what I'm about to write you. So that's why the whole rest of Jude is important. He said, Beloved, verse 3, when I gave all diligence, in other words, literally, when I made all haste to write unto you of our common salvation, and notice that our salvation in Christ is not being reinvented every day. It's the common salvation. It's the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. It's not up for amendment. It's not up for change. It's not up for being relevant to a new generation. Not that we shouldn't make the gospel relevant to every generation, to every culture, to every mission field. Tom and Donna go overseas to Haiti and and Indonesia and many other countries around the world and do tremendous mission work. And they want the gospel to be relevant. They work with business leaders and try to encourage them to start businesses and have witnesses for Christ. So we want to be relevant. But the gospel never changes. It's the same. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. It's a common salvation. And that's why there's always a battle in our generation and has been since the Enlightenment. It has been since the Garden of Eden, but it expresses itself different ways in different cultures at different times between revelation and reason. Folks have said our society is a secular society now based on science and reason. Well, we are if we reject the word of God. Either we're going to realize we don't know everything and God has allowed us to discover some things and therefore none of us would ever live long enough to become God ourselves. And if we lived long enough, we wouldn't become God ourselves. And so we need revelation. We need God to tell us the truth inerrantly, infallibly, and once and for all, for all time. Or we're going to depend on our reason and our understanding and the changing mores of the day and go with the flow and believe as Christianity. And it doesn't work that way. James wrote this Catholic epistle. Now notice I didn't say Roman Catholic epistle, it's Catholic epistle. The word Catholic means universal. He wrote this letter to the whole church before he died because he was so exercised that what was happening was that uh, certain men, verse 4, had crept in unawares to the church. Now this will always happen. And we're told that they turned the grace of God, verse 4, into lasciviousness. That means licentiousness, sensuality. They turn the grace of God into do whatever you want because God's grace is upon you. You ever heard that? It's kind of modern, isn't it? He says, when you do that, you've just revealed who you are. You're one of those creepers. Your condemnation is from old. You're denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And so Jude says in verse 5, I want to put you in remembrance. You plural, not you singular. It starts with all of us being singular, but he's talking to us as a church, as a body of believers. And within the church there are going to be those who do not believe. And that's what happened to the church in Israel. They were taken across the Red Sea. They were going into the promised land. And Jude says, don't forget, God destroyed those that did not believe. 
God will destroy all those who are professing Christians today in the church around the world who do not believe. Now, there's still time to believe. And if you don't believe, I hope you'll believe before we end this sermon uh, and before we end this service today. But he gives us examples of how the angels kept not their first estate and they're reserved in eternal darkness. And then he gives us the example in verse 7 of Sodom and Gomorrah. They had gone after strange flesh. You know, if God wanted to say something, he could say it no plainer than he did right here. We read in this same article, I was proud of the journal, they said, biblical roots of opposition to same-sex marriage. And then they quote Leviticus 18, 22, and 23. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination, and you shall not lie with any beast and defile yourself with it. Neither shall any woman give herself to a beast to lie with it. It is perversion. Leviticus 20, 13. If a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall be put to death. Their blood is upon them. That's the law of God. It doesn't change. That's why we need a Savior. You and I cannot keep the law, no matter what our sin is. And all sin is sin. All sin brings death. God loves all of us who are sinners. Pastor Dave, as I was preparing this message before, the song that kept running through my heart was, Christ receives sinful men. Christ will receive you. He'll receive me. If you've been a victim of somebody else's sodomy or lesbianism or molestation, God loves you. He wants to save you. He wants to transform you. He wants to deliver you. But it won't be without a spiritual battle. I was at a church meeting recently, and the pastor had had enough courage in this mainline denomination to bring a series on these issues. And one church member stood up and said, I've been here longer than anybody else. And I've heard the stories of people changing when they're into, and he said, homosexuality, but it's sodomy. It's going after strange flesh, and it doesn't work. He just revealed to me he didn't know the Lord. When you and I are, sin, are saved from our sins, it doesn't mean we don't have a struggle with those sins. It doesn't mean we don't have a battle. It doesn't mean there's not victory to be won every day through the cross. But God has made us new creatures in Christ, and we want to learn how to live the exchange life. And we want to get victory over those uh, feelings of victimization or oppression or imprisonment in our minds that others have inflicted them. And if we're a victimizer, God loves us. He wants to save us. But he cannot do it unless we repent and believe the gospel. And he will not do it unless we repent and believe the gospel. Now, one of the um, disturbing trends that I believe we see in our churches today, and any of us can fall into heresies, and somebody as well said heresy is truth out of balance, and that's true, is an easy believism. But nothing's new under the sun. How many of you have ever heard of uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones? He was the Queen's chaplain in e England for a number of years, and he wrote a book called The Puritans, and it's a great book on church history. And in, one, in that book, there's a chapter on Sandiman, Sandimanianism, which was nothing but just plain easy believism. And he says this is a good way to define it, that <clears throat> the whole benefit of the cross and resurrection is conveyed to men only by the apostolic report concerning it, that everyone who understands this report to be true or is persuaded that the event actually happened as testified by the apostles, is justified and finds relief to his guilty conscience. Translated means, if you just give mere intellectual assent to the resurrection, you're going to be fine. Not quite. You realize that one of the major themes of modern television programs today is resurrection. They don't look at it as supernatural necessarily anymore or out of the ordinary. It's just something we don't understand. You watch television to see that. The Bible says we're only saved if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. 
But you see, these folks in Jude have denied the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So just giving mere intellectual assent to the historical fact of the resurrection, and it was historical and it was a fact, that won't save you and it won't save me. But boy, we can go along to get along that way and just go with the flow and our guilty conscience is never salved and our sins are never forgiven and we're never transformed and we never go through repentance. My dear mom is 94 years old and what a job she did in raising my brother and sister and I in the fear of the Lord. And we returned last April, I may have told you Pastor Dave and Nikki and the church, to the church we grew up in, 100 year old anniversary of their sanctuary. But the neighborhood has changed and the church has changed and they're a member of a mainline denomination that's just improved, approved doing same-sex marriages and the church is about to die. They can't afford a pastor. And being in there, there were those involved, I'm sure, in sodomy and lesbianism and God loves every one of them. And so after the sermon, the lady pastor who was preaching that day said, who will give a testimony of what this church has meant to them? And I stood up and I said, in 1934, under the teaching of Mrs. Dorothy Carlson, my mom was soundly converted to Christ in hearing the word of God. And I shut up and sat down. Well, these two ladies that I think were living together in a lesbian relationship, I think it made an impression on them. And they turned around and kind of made a comment after some others had talked about the church being a blessing to them. And said, you know, after what we've heard today, we might want to start doing some things differently. I love those ladies for Christ's sake. I pray if they don't know a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, they'll come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But unless you and I have heard the word of God and believed in the word of God, we haven't been soundly converted. How did it happen in my mom's life? Well, she tells us that she was listening to a Bible story by Mrs. Carlson in Sunday school and that's why it's important to hear the word of God in Sunday school, small group, worship, worship services. You never, it won't ever return boy. And she said, it's time, I need to believe this, it's time that I believe. And so before she was baptized, she wanted to be baptized after that. That's the first step of obedience if we're true Christians. We'll want to follow the Lord in baptism. And a lot of things will come into place if we'll follow in obedience that way. And so her mother said, Jerry, quit crying. And my mom was so moved to tears in repentance and faith at the sacrifice of Christ for her as a sinner, 14-year-old girl, that she couldn't stop crying. It wasn't made up. It was the fruit of putting trust in Christ and God giving her repentance. Why? Because she had listened and believed the word of God. Now, your conversion may have been more gradual. It may have been instantaneous and more dramatic. But have you ever put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? And if you're not sure, then do it today. I have the privilege of working with an older gentleman. He teaches a Sunday school class at a large church in Snellville. And the church is going downhill, but his Sunday school class is staying the same and growing. And we've been praying together and uh, meeting on a monthly basis, and his burden was, Kerry, pray that I'll lead people to Christ. And as he's been praying, he's been saying, if you're not saved, if you don't know you know Christ as Savior, let me know. I'll be glad to talk with you. And he's had three, four, maybe five people contact him and say, Roger, I'm not sure I really am saved. Now, some of the people have probably already received Christ. But thank God the Word of God is stirring them up so that they can come to the place of assurance in their own life that they know they trust Christ in Him alone. And then you can go forward in your Christian life. But if you're always wondering, am I really saved or not? Then you'll never put a foot in the ground to go forward because you'll be just like a wavering seed. Martin Lloyd-Jones goes on to say that this orthodox doctrine <clears throat> lays less stress on the activity of the will as that goes out in the trust of the heart and its attendance, obedience to life. You see, Pastor Dave and I were taught in our training, I'm sure he was and I was, well, we have this Old Testament, they lived under the law, and then we got this New Testament, and we're under grace. And those are different dispensations, and, and Pastor Tim as well, I'm sure, had the same training. 
I'd like to encourage you to look at this a little bit differently this morning. Genesis 6, 8 says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. See, everybody didn't get grace, but Noah did. Why? Because Hebrews eleven six 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please God, for he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And it goes on to say in verse 7, And therefore Noah went on to prepare an ark to save his whole family and condemn his society. It was a witness against the world. Here's this fool building this boat. <laughs> he thinks he's going to rain. Who was laughing when the boat was closed? Now that's how you and I have to prepare to live as Christians. A fellow was walking down the street, as I may have told you before, in a sign on the front of him and said, I am a fool for Christ. And in the New York City, as he went by the people, they laughed until they read the sign on the back of him that asked the question, whose fool are you? And that's what Christ would ask us today. There's no middle ground. You and I have to decide, are we going to be a fool for Christ or are we going to be somebody else's fool? We're all dumb sheep. How many of you have seen the movie Far From the Madding Crowd? It's a Thomas Hardy novel, an old classic, English classic. And I never will forget the scene in there that one night this old sheepdog comes back home and his master's sleeping. And the sheepdog, I don't know whether he was put up to it by some bad guys or he just went crazy mentally, but he stirred up the sheep. They broke down their gates. He ran them to the edge of the cliff and they all fell to their deaths, 250 of them on the shores of the ocean. You see, we're all dumb sheep. And what a sheep does is only looks as far as the rear end of that sheep in front of him. And if that sheep in front of him goes off, he goes with them. All we like sheep have gone astray, but we need to return to the bishop of our souls, and that's Christ himself. Well, we must hurry and, and we must end, but that's why we need to preach the law of God. I was in Sunday school class with Pastor Dave and Nikki and the wonderful group in their class, and I've been in Pastor Tim's class and the wonderful group they have there, and we're talking about the law of God. You see, the Bible says the law of God brings the knowledge of sin, Romans chapter 3. And we as a church, we're preaching grace, 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 and nobody, you know, is really affected. Why? Because we haven't preached law, law, law of what is demanded of us. And none of us can keep those commands. None of us can keep those demands. That's why we need a Savior. But as a Baptist preacher in Swanee told me years ago, who was a good friend of my dad's, before going into ministry, he said, Carrie, you will never have any problem getting anybody saved. I said, what? He said, no, no, you'll never have any problem getting anybody saved. I said, what do you mean? He says, you'll have a problem getting them lost, but if you ever get them lost, it'll be easy to get them saved. He said, I went to visit a man in Swanee, and this was years ago, who was thought by many in the, the neighborhood and the township to have tied his wife to the railroad tracks and she was murdered when the train came through. And I said to him, do you know, Mr. So-and-so, that God loves you? He says, I know that. I'm not such a bad guy. You see, that fella didn't think he was lost. And therefore, there was never any hope for him to be saved unless he would have come to that point. And that's the same for you and me. If we don't think we're bad enough to go to hell, we're not a candidate for the grace of God. And we won't see a need for that. Now, to the woman at the well who had five husbands, Jesus preached grace. Why? She didn't have a problem thinking she was a sinner. She knew she was a sinner. She didn't think God could forgive her. But Jesus let her know he had eternal life for her. And she said, come see a man that's told me everything I've ever done. She became an evangelist. My grandmother, my mom's mom was like that. She came from a generation unlike my baby boomer generation, which thought, you know, God couldn't send anybody to hell. Nobody deserves to go to hell. My grandmother's generation thought, how could God ever let any sinner into his righteous heaven? And so she never had assurance of salvation until one day she heard the song being sung. His eye is on the sparrow, and he watches over me. And my grandmother concluded, if God takes care of a sparrow, he'll take care of me. 
as a sinner and as a person. And he'll do the same for you. He'll do the same for me. Psalm 19.7 says, The law converts the soul, and the testimony of the Lord makes wise the simple. If you want to get salvation in the minds of people, you've got to bring them under conviction. Now, we don't do that by banging them on the head. We ask if we can talk with them. We speak the truth in love. We ask that our speech be seasoned with salt, full of grace. But at some point, as Jesus did with every encounter, the Holy Spirit has to put his finger on our sin. Isaiah 58 says, cry out against the sins of my people. Spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgressions and the house of Judah their sins. That's what the church needs to hear today. Not grace until we've shown where we've fallen short because everybody in the church today on both sides of the issue we've highlighted from this newspaper article would be strong on the grace of God. But some are turning the grace of God into lewdness, lasciviousness, and their damnation is sure. Now we end. What do we do about it? And Jude gives us application through the roof. Look at verse 20. But you, beloved, and he uses three commands here with also a number of participles or or, um, subjective phrases. He says, build yourselves up on your most holy faith. He's talking to us in the plural. Keep yourself in the word of God. Pastor Dave's doing that with you on Wednesday night, Living the Word, Dr. Hendricks series. I've heard that's going well, Pastor Dave, and praise God for it. Keep ourselves in the Word by our personal devotions. Keep yourself in the Word. If you have a family, read one chapter of Scripture every day and pray. No more than 10 minutes with your family every day. Take Sundays off. But when you start reading the Word of God in your home, you'll be a home of prayer every day. And you'll protect yourself from evil. You'll gain God's provision when you lock on to Him for that. And thirdly, you'll be a light to the world. And we need to do that. Secondly, we need to pray in the Holy Spirit. I was here last Sunday night for the monthly or the bi monthly prayer meeting. Pastor Dave says he hopes to increase it monthly. No church is stronger than his prayer life. It was a beautiful service. Praying for those that we have a burden for, for salvation. We took communion, there was intercession. This morning, Pastor Dave was interceding for someone I've led to the Lord. As I said, pray that this young man will take the next step in the baptism and grow in the Lord. And I could just sense the Spirit of God praying through him. See, that's praying in the Holy Spirit. That's how people grow. That's how they move forward. Prayer. And then he says, the other way we keep ourselves in the love of God is we look for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ into eternal life. Jesus is coming back. We don't know when, but keep that hope. So those three things keep us in the love of God. Finally, verse 22, we're to, on some, have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. We're to save others. We're to keep ourselves in the love of God. And you say, well, Carrie, I can't save anybody. No, you can't, but in Christ you can. You can save some with compassion. They can see our good works. They can glorify our fathers in heaven. And by the grace of God, we can scare the bejeebers out of some others. Say, don't mess with this. Don't trifle with the word of God. Your eternity is at stake. God will show us what to say, when, to whom, in love. And they'll know us in love. They may reject it. They may even crucify us. But that's what happened to the apostles because they were faithful to preach the word of God. So now we come to our time of decision and discipleship. We Baptists are good about decisions, but I thank you for a church being committed also to discipleship. So I'm going to ask Pastor Dave in a second to come forward. We're going to have a hymn of invitation. You may have a burden of prayer to share with him. You can come whisper it in his ear. You may come want to receive Christ. You may say, Dave, I've been through baptism. I've been through church membership, but man, I'm not sure I'm going to have. Whatever your spiritual need, you come as we stand and as we sing, Pastor Dave.